So you say you're you're honest with your kids. Yeah, uh, almost 100 percent of the time, like without fail, almost 100 percent of the time. They know you're addicted to opiates. Oh yeah, for pretty much the entire time that I've been using them, they know that that I've been using them. My kids are pretty smart, um, which is nice. It's it's great to have kids that are so intelligent. You know, it's, it's a blessing. It'll be great for their futures, but it's also a curse because they're pre- they're very astute. They can pick up on things. As soon as they picked up on some changes, they asked me, and I, you know, I can't. I don't feel good about lying to them. The way I look at it, the truth comes out in the end. And, um, you know, like I said before, that I am. Um, I I've I've hurt people that love me, um, people that I didn't really think cared too much about me, um, and I've I've learned by dragging everybody through this, you know, with me alongside me, um, how much they really do, you know, care for me and what they'd be willing to do for me, and they've all suffered so much because they just happen to love me that like I refuse to I refuse to do any more damage to them. I'm not gonna, um, I'm not gonna have them get a phone call one day that says, you know, I'm gone and, and, and have them be not only blindsided by my loss, but the fact that I even had a problem, you know, that I was even at risk of anything because they didn't even know I was using. Like, I gotta, I gotta honor them and respect them by, by answering their questions. If they ask me, if they want to know, they're ready to know. How long have you been addicted? Gosh, it's been, wow, it's been three years now, actually, to the exact years? month. Three years. So you didn't, you didn't start like many do as a teenager or anything like that? No, not, not my drug of choice, um, which, which is, is heroin. Yeah, I'm an opiate addict. Um, I guess I've always been an opiate addict from the way it's described or the way they explain it to me, you know, all the professionals, they say it's like a sleeper, <laughs> you know? And uh, I just, I guess I just woke it up, you know, three years ago, but. Is it in your family? Oh, addiction in general, yeah. I, I lost my brother to this addiction, addiction to this drug. Oh, really? Um, six years ago. In March, six years ago. And anyone in your parental side? Um, addicted, oh yeah. But, you know, fortunately, we haven't lost anybody else. But, you know, my parents both, um, I mean, my mom is an alcoholic. And she used to do a really good job of uh, being a uh, productive, <laughs> alcoholic or how do they say it? functioning alcoholic not so much anymore my father is a recovered or recovering alcoholic i'm really proud of him actually um, he won't have a beer now he quit smoking cigarettes and everything so um just about actually no every single one of us in my immediate family that i grew up with uh, we are we're addi- we're addicts we've been addicted so do you do you feel shame in your situation or do you see it as something you just inherited from your family? Both. Have you OD'd? The log. Oh god. Yeah. 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 I don't actually I don't I don't know how many times. At least ten. Hmm. Uh, at least ten. Expl- I, explain to those that are watching like h- how you can OD 10 times and not decide to quit. I because can't common, explain common it. sense, I'm sure you're very sensible as as most of the people I interview are, yeah. but it's it's much bigger than that. I can't explain it. I can't explain it. Uh, so somebody who I somebody who I consider a family member, somebody who has been in my life a long time and, and was very close friends with my little brother before he passed. 
explained it the best I've heard it so far. And um, I was talking about going to treatment and I really thought this time was gonna be the time that I went. And um, you know, my, my mother and my boyfriend were on my case about it. Like, you need to go, you need to go. And you know, it'll be free and it's all, you know, it's set up for you and just listen to the lady from the county, it'll be fine. And man, I just was so caught on the fact of, I didn't wanna, I was scared to go be alone. I didn't wanna go away and go check into inpatient treatment. Um, I was afraid of the ways that life would move on and change without me while I was away. For a long time, I didn't want to be separated from my boyfriend. <laughs> Even though the longer I stayed out here, the farther apart we grew. And the more I was actually separated from him, in fact, anyway, because he just wouldn't be around me. Um, he, he didn't want to see me like that. So... You know, I was telling my friend, like, I didn't want to go, and I can just do, I just got to find a good outpatient. If I could just find a good outpatient clinic, then, I mean, I'm all for it. I just, somebody's going to help me do that. And, and my friend just, like, totally just, like, snapped me into reality. And he said, you know, you should really hear yourself. That's just your addiction talking. You really can't trust your thoughts right now. You're honestly gonna sit here and tell me you think you don't need inpatient treatment. He said, honey, you're just trying to set it up to where you can please the family and go do what everyone's asking of you, but still be able to use drugs while you're in treatment. And I was like, huh. Huh. <laughs> Because I didn't know that's what I was doing. I really, I didn't, I was, it wasn't like a conscious thing. But when he put it to me like that, I was like, you're right. That's what I'm doing. I'm, 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 I'm making a contingency plan. It's a just in case. That way I could still use, you know what I mean? Just in case, like I'm not feeling it. Just in case I'm not ready. And he told me, you know, it's like, um, it's like a parasite. It takes over, it gets in your brain, and it just fucks up your thought. Can I say that? Yeah. It fucks up your thoughts. And you can't even trust yourself. As a matter of fact, you're the, the person, you, you're the last person you should trust right now. Hmm. Honey, throw all that shit out, and you need to just listen, just go, and just surrender. This person also happened to be one of my dealers. <laughs> so, you know, if I really, if I was really gonna go get the shit, I mean, he was gonna sell it to me. He didn't like that I was doing it, but you know, he was like, man, I wish you would stop, but I'd rather you come get it from me. What were you doing before you got addicted? Cause you, you're, you're, how old are you? I'm 40, I you're just turned 40. 40. And you got addicted at 37? Yeah. Yeah. What was that all about? Mm. Yeah, I don't know. It's kind of like getting a divorce. It's like it's not any one thing that makes you do it, right? Um, so I actually, when I started using heroin, um, I mean, I wasn't using, uh, I wasn't popping Vicodins or using, uh, a lot of people were like, I heard smoking blues or whatever they were calling them at the time. And, I wasn't using any kind of other opiates leading up to it. And I didn't know anybody who was using heroin. I'd never been around heroin users before. Yeah, I, I know, I see that. You're, you're like, what? So I actively seeked out this drug. Um, I had some things that had happened and over a period of about two years, it just seemed like one thing after the other, after the other, 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 other. And it just was built up. And it was so, it was all just weighing on me so heavy. Um, and my support system had totally changed because a couple of the things that happened were, um, you know, the breakup of my family, um, the end of my marriage of 22 years. 
um, the the realization that my my children, my three daughters, were not ever going to be living in the same home with me again, needing me to make them a breakfast or braid their hair after the bath, you know, like that. All that was gone, and and those people that I went to when I needed support or comfort, they weren't there anymore. Not that they wouldn't have been there for me, but they weren't in my day-to-day -day life. And like, I didn't know how to cope with that or the other things that were happening um, that were just too much for me. And I was hurting. I just was hurting so bad. I'm still hurting so bad. Sorry. Would you say that mental health is what was behind your addiction? Let's say pain, you know, pain. Yeah, and that's, and that's a ment mental health, right? You know, whether or not you are, a lot of people hear mental health and they think like, oh, crazy or, you know, no, I just something mean like your, that. Your stress of life and. Right, and, and we all have struggles dealing with our mental health. You know, and that's what it was for me is I just, it, I, I didn't know how to cope anymore. Um, I still am trying to accept and come to terms with the fact that my brother is, has died. Like, fuck getting on with figuring out how to grieve him. Like, I'm not even, I haven't even really accepted it yet, you know. And that was just one of the number of things. So it just was a lot. And I decided I needed to escape from this. And I remembered my brother telling me one time, you know, I was begging him, asking him, please, will you just leave this shit alone? Um, I don't get what it is, you know, like, why does that have such a hold on you? Like, don't you love us? Don't you see, like, we love you so much, we just want you back. And what is it about this shit that you just can't? let go and come home like why is it controlling you and he said to me that it was so much nicer being comfortably numb than having to hurt all day every day from from everything that he carried around with him you know and boy i did not forget that <laughs> so, so, so you chose to oh, pick up fentanyl after your brother died from it. it I picked up heroin. Heroin. Yeah. Um, a fentanyl is a that's a that's a very new development for me. But yeah, I did. I remembered him saying that, and I and I went out and I actively seeked out the heroin. Um, I had a hard time getting it at first because I, you know, I'm like upper middle class suburban, you know, white soccer mom looking lady at the time, and. I was asking people in the hood where I hadn't lived for very long. And um, they were like, man, get out of here. You look like the police. And uh, it, it took a little bit, but I figured out what kind of lingo to use and what kind of language, you know, relaxed them. And before long, it was maybe a few days of trying and I had a bag of heroin and literally had to ask somebody how to use it. <laughs> and I started by smoking it. And yeah, that was about three years ago. And um, about two months ago, a little less maybe, um, I found myself unable to find heroin like I did at home in Sacramento. I've been down here in downtown LA now about two months. And um, the few times that I have been able to find heroin, it was too expensive. And what is readily available what is just like rampant down here like it's like everybody seems to be using fentanyl so i mean of course i had a choice but it didn't feel like i had much of a choice you know it's like be sick or do fetty and so i've been using fentanyl for about six or seven weeks now What does your family think of you? Or do they understand, given their history? I'm scared to know what they think of me, really. I mean, 
I think if I asked them, they would talk a lot about their love for me and how they desire for our relationships to be repaired and how they want me to have a prosperous, you know, happy life. But um, I, I'm scared to hear what they might tell somebody else if somebody else asked about me. Because putting know? the addict in shame pretty much ensures that they're going to stay right where they're at. Right. Oh, this gets a little bit more complicated too, because I know we started out this interview with me telling you I'm, I'm honest with my kids. Like my kids know I'm a drug addict and they know, you know, um, because almost 100% of the time I am honest with them always. But um, the purpose for me coming down to downtown LA, coming down to LA, the, the greater Los Angeles area in the first place, was to get out of Sacramento, to get away from the people and the places and the things that I associated with my addiction, that made it easy for me to live that out and stay in that lifestyle. Um, and I came to go to treatment and I uh, like <laughs> didn't have the heart to tell everybody that um, I'm not a treatment <laughs> yet. So, <laughs> you know, nobody's perfect. <laughs> and um, that's, so that's the big, that's the big fib. That's the big fib right now. You came down here to go to I program. came down to go to treatment and I've not been in treatment. And my family believes, um, it's crazy, like, because I value being honest to them so much, and I really do. But damn it, I hate hearing the disappointment in their voices. I hate hearing how much they worry about me. And I, I knew that they wanted me to come to treatment and that they knew that's why I came down here. And I didn't want to tell them that once I got down here, um, that I wasn't in treatment like they believed and hoped. So. What's your biggest fear? It's not even dying. Dying's not my biggest fear. Well, kind of, uh, kind of it is. It's, um, it's devastating my daughters somehow, in some way, so that they in turn become like me and they feel irrevocably broken. And then they wind up living out the same type of mistakes and suffering the same path that I have. I'm, I'm, I'm not scared to die, you know, they're, I won't lie, I've, I've tried to take my own life. Um, I'm, I'm done with suffering, I, I'm tired of suffering. Um, I might even, you know, I'd probably even welcome it at this point if it weren't for those girls. Because I, that's my biggest fear, because I'm terrified to hurt them anymore. Like. It's a crazy disease. It really is a crazy disease because um, I, I like to think of myself as, as a highly intelligent person. Um, I'm, I'm decently educated. I'm pretty emotionally intelligent. I'm, I'm insightful. I pick up on people's energies and I can read the, the vibe of a room, you know, pretty well. And, um, and I know what type of actions and decisions lead to what type of outcomes and what helps you reach goals and what, you know, what hinders that process. And I'll be damned if I just can't seem to just fucking get on board and do the right shit to bring me the outcome that I desire. It's like there's a disconnect. And, you know, I, 
I don't know how better to to look at it or describe it than than my friend did that time to me, which is, man, like I just can't trust my own judgment or my own thoughts. You know, there is a disconnect. I can't explain why it's there or where it came from, but I just know that because of it, I I can't be the one being in charge of making healthy decisions. You know. I haven't been able to do it yet, you know. Yeah. I guess I guess they're gonna watch this too. My my daughter is. They're old enough. My my kids are twenty four, nineteen, and sixteen years old. And at their ages. Were you there to raise them for most of their lives? Yes, most of their lives. Mm. Yes, yeah. That was that kind of broke my heart too. Is that was one of the things that um, I still haven't been able to figure out how to like just swallow that pill and come to terms with that. That, that the last you know five years or so of their childhoods at home, where they should have been with me with their father or both of us, that I wasn't there, you know? Yeah, you're an unusual case because most people make it to their late thirties and don't get caught up in this stuff. Yeah, it is a little odd though, right? It is that I would um, find myself having these problems so late in my life I guess, you know, it's not that I never um, experienced troubles or not that I've never um, dabbled with uh, substances or anything like that, but um, I only went so far with it, you know, and it was a very recreational way, um, the things that I did try. Um, they didn't stay, you know, in my life for long. And I didn't, you know, become like a hardcore user. I mean, you wouldn't have caught me using needles for anything um, back in the day, you know, before the last three years. And um, you certainly, you know, wouldn't have seen me using anything all day, every day, or for a stretch of you know, a couple of years. It was just kind of like here and there. It was really, it was for, it was for party. It was for fun, fun, you know? Um, and when it got to be too much or when I felt like it started affecting shit, you know, in my life or things around me, like I would just, you know, kick it to the curb and, you know, just get back to business, you know? And uh, it's not easy to do that, this stuff. It's really got a hold on me. Yeah. Do you have any? Do you have any insight? Do you have any ideas? <laughs> Does anybody, you know, any ideas? That I should. <laughs> yeah. Is it about just a maybe a genetic disposition to addiction for you, or is it somehow self worth comes into play and? Yeah, the the this, the mental strain of you know everything, losing your brother and and being a parent and growing older as a female and and all these things combined put you in this situation. I really, I really believe it's both. I really believe that. All of that comes into play. I really believe it does. And I'm sure there are people that deal with similar things that don't ever become, you know, intravenous opiate addicts. And that's cool. <laughs> but um, I, I'm sure that it, that those are absolutely major risk factors because I know in my case, 
Um, I can't rule either one of those things out. I believe a thousand percent that a genetic predisposition has contributed in some way. I know that it has. You told me it was your uncle, your brother. Oh yeah. Both your parents are alcoholic. Both my parents. But you yeah. lost your uncle. Both you my brothers. Your... I lost my brother. I lost my brother. It was my children's uncle. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, my brother, and and he was only a couple of years younger than me. We were. Oh man. Oh, I see. You're true. Yeah. You're that was my. He was my. He was my heart. Man, like. It just, it, honestly, he was he was one of the types of people that um, you hear people talk about someone once they're gone when they pass away. And, um, you know, they're talking about somebody special. When just about everybody who has something to say about them tells you how incredible they were. And, oh, wow, you know, he was the type of person who just walk in the room and just every, command the attention of everybody. Just everybody would be laughing or he would just you know, come in and the whole energy is his spirit was so every single person, even people who didn't get along with my brother in his life, when he when he died, um, would say things like this about him. You know, he's truly, truly missed. Like his absence is really felt um, all the time. Every family gathering, every everything. Uh, where you might have an uncle or a brother or a son present. Um, we all know how much we're missing out because he's not there. And um, I believe that for him too, it was the same thing. I know that he had some trying things that he didn't know how to cope with. And for him and I, this is just our best, you know, albeit unhealthy, coping mechanism this is just what we for us what how you helped us it. feel the best and cope the best as far as how we felt but not only that i know that for him as well um, that predisposition to these things because you can't you you can't convince me that all five members of an immediate family are gonna have some sort of addiction or another and it just happens to be just Coincidental. What do you tell your kids about <laughs> their future? Yeah, it worries me too. Sure. Um, I one of my children right now is of drinking age already, and um, you know, two two of them, two of them smoke pot sometimes. One of them more than the other because uh, she's older and very independent. And uh, I recently had one of my girls express to me that she's thinking about going and getting some, getting some help to um, get a handle on her, on her drinking habit. That she's worried that she might be overindulging and she doesn't want to wind up with a bigger problem. So yeah, it worries me a lot. Um, and I, yeah, and I, I have made them aware that um, this is a genetic thing that can be passed down within families and that um, all of their, you know, responsible um, habits and their you know, they're smart decision making and, they, you know, they're good choices and making friends and all that uh, put aside, uh, they can still be affected by it and that they need to be mindful. Um, you know, I make, I make an example of myself. I try to really put the spotlight when I talk to them about this stuff, put the spotlight on me in a way that, you know, reminds them what they don't want, the outcome they don't want, you know, how they don't want their kids to suffer or anybody to suffer the way that they're suffering because of me. Yeah. So there's just guilt everywhere. There's just guilt all around. Yeah. You know? That just makes it even harder. Hmm? And that just makes it even harder. Oh yeah. 
yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh then then it's a it's it's a little more of that weight, you know, a little more of um, shame and guilt that you'd like to numb. Yeah, a little more that you'd like to numb. Mm -hmm. It does. It really. It, I was just talking to somebody about this. Um, a friend of mine last night was telling me we were talking about this this man who I I uh, had a relationship with for the last couple of years, and um, this just ended I guess or I'm, I'm trying to accept the fact that it's ended when I talk about him which I do all the time every day when I talk about him to people I still call him I still call him my husband um, it just became too much for him too because you know it's it's hurtful to watch somebody almost die and spend 14 and a half weeks in the hospital and then get discharged and five days later be shooting up heroin. It's hurtful to be worried about them constantly dying or what may happen to them out on the street um, or to have people coming up to you and saying they think that your your girlfriend is, is prostituting herself because she's her movements are odd and she's going from door to door in the hotel or whatever and when really I'm just... Uh, that's like the farthest, that's the most way out shit I've ever heard. That's a really far fetched from my world, which is like upper middle class suburbia. But to him who, you know, he's in his 50s and he's from, you know, inner city Chicago. And um, when, when you move like that, it equals selling yourself. <laughs> Whereas for me, I, I mean, I'm just going, I'm knocking on, I'm trying to find out who's got what I need. <laughs> I'm sick, I need to get well. Who has my medicine? You know, but that, it all became too much for him. And, um, and um, it all added up to more guilt for me. You know, um, the last I saw him, I left him. He came down here to support me. And he's sitting with me in the emergency room, I was, I was withdrawing and boy, did it hurt. And I said, I need to go to the hospital. Um, I need to go to the hospital. I can't take this anymore. I can't take the pain. It's too bad. He said, okay, baby, I got you. Just like he always would. And, you know, he darn near scooped me up and called the Uber, put me in the back of that car and just had me in his lap the whole way there, petting my hair and telling me I, you know, I can do it, I'm so strong, and he's so proud of me and all that. Every, anything he could to try to like build me up to get me to feel myself like I could do it, you know? And even that wasn't, um, wasn't enough, you know? I still, in the face of this monster, I just felt so weak. I mean, I felt so weak and we were waiting in the emergency room, in the waiting room, and we waited and waited and waited. A few times I even told them, like, please get me a doctor. I'm afraid of what I might do. I'm afraid I might hurt myself. This pain hurts so bad. I just wanted to stop. And then I um, couldn't do it anymore. And he got up to go check on his charging phone in the next room. And I dipped out. I was wearing his jacket and everything. It's, it's, I know, right? It's so messed up. And you got to remember, we're, we live in Sacramento. So, he, I mean, he had never been down here before. And, you know, we were in Long Beach at the hospital. He didn't know where he was. Uh, when he realized I left, he didn't know where I had went. I was wearing his jacket because I was having, you know, it was I was going hot, cold, hot, cold. I wasn't well. I didn't realize I had his identification, his credit card, you know, his everything in his wallet inside of the jacket. And um, man, I just took off and per usual with no care uh, about being mindful of time or uh, 
anybody else's feelings and um, I never did get the fix. <laughs> I never did find what I needed. But I, I found a spot in the dirt somewhere in Long Beach where I just found myself too exhausted to go anymore. I just, I couldn't find my way back to the hospital. And I was so sick from not having the drug. And I was tired. And I literally just laid down. I laid down in the dirt in his pants jacket and I fell asleep. And, you know, by the time I got back home with him again, he was already on his way back home to Sacramento. And that was the last time I saw him. Um, so talk about guilt. I'm just really good at just giving myself, like, serving after serving of it. The crazy thing is, like, I know how to stop that but I can't seem to do it. I really can't. And, and we're talking like my kids. I mean, what more is there? Like, there's nothing I love more on this planet than these three girls, man. They're just everything for me. They're like the, they're like my breath, you know. And I thought I was gonna marry this guy, you know. I really did. He was incredible to my kids. He was pretty beautiful too, and you know, we had similar interests. That's it, that's all over. And I'm just left with like memories and regret, you know? It's like, I don't know how to do anything nowadays that doesn't just um, leave me feeling regretful. I did just a couple of days ago, take a step in the right direction and um, I called my home county's um, Medi-Cal insurance office and I asked them about doing treatment down here and they confirmed what I had heard before, which was that um, in order to get anything other than emergency care outside of that county where it's my home county. I have to switch my home county to wherever it is that I'd like to get that care. And that includes for treatment, rehab. So I did it. I did it. But that's all I did. <laughs> like, like I, I did that. I switched it. And I'm like, okay, well now, well, you know, I guess now I'll just, you know, get up the nerve to go to treatment. <laughs> I hope that doesn't take very long. No. Now I got to figure out, am I going to, um, am I going to just let them watch this? And, you know, hear it. The truth that, that I've been down here, but I haven't really gotten any help yet. Or am I going to or am I gonna call them first and give them a heads up? All right, Amanda, thank you so much for sharing your story. Yeah, yeah. I wish you all the luck in the world. You're gonna need it. Oh, shit, you're telling me. Well, I mean, hopefully we'll speak again. Yeah. And um, I'm really, really praying that by then I'll have a, a, a different, different scenario to describe to you. 
you get a better ending to the story. Yeah, you get the, a fight of a lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. Take care of yourselves, everybody. Love yourselves and and love the people that love you and make make good choices. You only have one life, and it doesn't have to be so hard. Everybody hurts. It is going to be painful no matter what, but it doesn't have to be so hard. So just, just want to tell everybody that. All right, Amanda. Thank you very much. Okay.